This is the first in a series of videos in which I'll be investigating the fundamentals of magnetic core memory. This series of videos is intended to promote a book I'm about to release and the book will go into far more detail than the videos but hopefully we'll still be able to cover uh, most of the fundamentals and uh, give you a good idea as to how this technology works if you're not already familiar with it. Magnetic core memory dates back to the 1940s and although it could be argued that a computer such as ENIAC was the first electronic computer, there was one built back in the 1930s and it used a series of capacitors built into rotating drums as its memory storage system. From that point forward, as computers developed quite rapidly, one of the fundamental restrictions was the amount of available memory. And in fact that restriction has only fairly recently uh, been dealt with in terms of low cost memory. Even 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was a thriving business in the theft of computer memory because it was such an expensive commodity. And really there were all types of uh, memory systems tried and developed over the years. But one of the ones that lasted longest and took the biggest steps forward was magnetic core memory. If you're not familiar with it, then it's really a series of ferrite cores arranged in arrays and the data is stored in the magnetization state of the cores. But the technology is quite interesting, so I'm going to start with the very fundamentals as to uh, how this uh, technology works. I'm not going to go into the uh, maths behind it. I'm going to try and keep the videos moving forward as much as I can. Uh, but if there is something in particular you want me to go back into uh, more detail on, then please leave a comment. Um, but the first thing is that uh, core memory is based around a collection of ferrite cores. And so the first thing to understand is the scale of the cores that we're talking about. So firstly, this core is of a pulse transformer, and as you can see, it's fairly large. The next one is of a filter, and that's about half the size. And the one we have left, which I don't know if you can see or not, is a fairly large example of a core used in a magnetic memory system. And in fact, the smaller ones that were developed would fit inside um, that core that were so small. Really, the limiting factor was the ability to assemble these things. And um, depending on the type of material that was used, it would dictate the performance and characteristics of the memory system in use. What we're going to do in the first video is just have a quick demonstration as to the difference between the ferrite material used for the memory cores and ferrite material used in something like a transformer. They do have fundamental differences and you could not, for example, use this type of ferrite in a magnetic memory system. It doesn't store any information. So we'll look at that first. So in order to do that, what I've got is a simple demonstration setup. I'll just get this out of the way. So we'll be using the curve tracer to do a few simple tests. And what I have here is a standard uh, inductor, small inductor setup. And uh, that's on the yellow wires. And on the blue wires we have, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's a very fine wire and one of the cores that we just looked at. As I said, these cores are extremely small. And in fact, I've got a container here and there are 50,000 of them in this container. So they are uh, extremely small, but as I said, these are still quite large compared to um, how small these did get when they were in full development. Okay, so what we're going to do is pass uh, AC uh, current through these two inductors. So we've got the inductor that's made up from the uh, magnetic core memory uh, core and then we've got another one that is a standard type inductor. So I'll move the camera now so that you can see the screen of the curve tracer, um, but just remember that the yellow wires are a standard inductor and the blue wires are for the magnetic core uh, from the memory system. Okay, so we're looking at the screen of my 577 curve tracer 
and I have the two inductors attached to the fixture and the curve tracer is set up to give us 50 millivolts uh, per division in the horizontal scale and 200 milliamps per division in the vertical scale. So I'll start by switching in the um, standard inductor and I'll increase the current that's been passed through that inductor and as you can see as the current increases we get a typical curve for an inductor and as the current increases uh, we just get a larger uh, signal showing on the screen but it is consistent it's um, just giving us um, the standard trace for inductor there are no kind of anomalies or lumps or bumps it's just consistent and the curve is based entirely on the current we're passing through the inductor. And we're getting some um, hysteresis in the signal as the AC is applied and that is of course just because the current and the voltage are out of phase because we are feeding the current through an inductor. So that's what we'd expect to see with a typical inductor but if I now switch in the magnetic core ferrite we'll see a very different type of response. So firstly it's very flat, it's very straight, there's very little hysteresis, very little lead and lag in the signal that we're looking at and it's also very linear so um, it's not really acting much like an inductor at this point but if we start to increase the current, so we're currently at around 200 milliamps and as we start to go up we'll see the beginnings of something very interesting and that's these two um, lumps appearing in the curve. If I keep increasing the current notice that they get bigger and bigger and also notice the um, point at which they start is always pretty much the same which is quite interesting so even though we're going higher in current and those signals are getting bigger the actual um, current at which they begin is fairly fixed. It's about 300, just slightly over 300 milliamps. If I keep going up in current you'll see they get bigger um, but even so the current at which they, um, these uh, bumps occur is still the same. It's around plus 300 milliamps, minus 300 milliamps. Remember we're applying AC to this uh, inductor and you can see that Something fairly strange is going on here that um, as the current increases it gets up to a certain point and then we get this anomaly and then the uh, line flattens out again. Now this is caused by the uh, core magnetization changing state. So what's happening here is in a particular half of the AC cycle the current is increasing, it's getting up to slightly over 300 milliamps, uh, that's uh, sufficient to generate a magnetic field and this current gives us a sufficiently strong magnetic field such that the flux in the core is forced to uh, effectively become magnetized in the opposite direction to what it was and that causes this uh, spike to appear and then when we go back the other way and we go into the opposite half cycle of the AC um, the reverse happens and as the current uh, again exceeds uh, that threshold this time in the opposite direction then it forces the core to change magnetization state yet again this time it flips the other way and again that causes this spike this is the mechanism by which we can use these cores to store information so what's uh, very clear here is if we keep the current below a certain uh, critical threshold then nothing changes um, but once we go above the critical threshold then we force the cores to flip their magnetization state and so we can use these imagine if we only had uh, one half of this AC phase so if we didn't go the other way we would cause uh, the core to change state. It would only happen the first time we cycled the current and uh, thereafter the core would remain magnetized in that state until we uh, apply a current in the opposite direction. 
So in other words, we will have stored a value uh, in the core, and then when we go uh, in the other direction, we can store the uh, inverse values. So if we assume that maybe uh, the top right-hand quadrant is storing a 1, then the bottom left hand could be deemed to be storing a zero. And that's how we make use of these calls to store uh, information. So I'll move the camera back uh, across and we'll investigate this a bit further and just discuss this in a bit more detail as to how we can make use of this to uh, create a memory system. Okay, so we have our magnetic core here, but it's far too small for me to be able to really demonstrate uh, anything sensibly on camera. So what I'm going to do is just use these. These are not actually the right sort of core, but they do look just like an enlarged version. So um, I use these for the demonstration, but just bear in mind that normally uh, these would be very much smaller and made from a different material. Okay, so the arrangement we had on the curve tracer was to have a core, and we had a wire passing through it, and that enabled us to pass current uh, through the wire and that generated a magnetic field and when that field was sufficiently strong it caused the magnetization state of the core to flip orientation. So if we pass current through from this direction for example uh, the core will flip uh, state into one direction. If we pass current the other way then the core will flip uh, the other way. And um, the, the key here is that the current has to be of sufficient magnitude for that to occur. If the current's too low, then no change will occur. And also, once we've flipped state by passing a current in one direction, if we pass even a high current again in the same direction, no further changes will occur. Um, the core will stay magnetized in the same orientation. We have to reverse the current to change the polarization of the magnetization state. So this allows us to store data and we could create a memory system. The problem if we had a single wire passing through each uh, individual core is that we'd need as many drivers and uh, detection circuits uh, for our memory system as we had cores. So if we wanted uh, a thousand bits, for example, we need a thousand driver circuits and a thousand amplifier circuits, which obviously would be impractical. So instead of doing that, what we do is we create an array, so we put more than one core on each of these wires, and that enables us to uh, effectively generate or create arrays of these uh, cores. And so that we can individually control the state of each of the cores, then what we do is we arrange them in a grid. So, for example, we would put uh, cores on wires and arrange them something like this. And you can now imagine this to be um, X lines. So the horizontal ones here we could say are the um, X values and the vertical would be our Y value. So as I said, if the current passing through a single wire is insufficient to generate a strong enough field to flip the magnetization state, then the core will remain unchanged. And what we can do now is make use of that. And uh, for example, if we want just this right hand core to change state, what we can do is we can pass half the required current through the X wire and half the required current through the Y wire. And the combined field from these two currents on these two wires would be sufficient to cause the uh, core to change state. Although there would be current flowing through the wire that's passing through the left hand core, because we're passing current through this wire of course, um, because we're not passing current through this Y wire, the field would only be half that required to flip the state of this core. So in other words, using this arrangement, we can select whichever core in the, in the array that we want and individually uh, cause it to flip states. So the way that these memory systems are arranged is, let's say you want a 64 uh, byte memory uh, that's made up of 8-bit words, then what you would do is you would create 
Uh, for example, there are different ways to lay this out, but one way you could do this is to create eight uh, what are called mats. So that would be uh, 64 um, calls in each mat, and you would uh, assemble eight mats. And each mat would be responsible for storing one bit of data in your word. So if we look at this single uh, array here as being one of the mats that would store a single bit, um, we still have a problem to overcome in that uh, we might want to store a 1 or we might want to store a 0. But because all the X lines in all the mats are common, so that is this X line passes through, if this is at the X0 line for example, passes through not only all the uh, X0 cores in this mat, but it also passes through all the X0 cores in the other 7 mats. And we need a way, for example, if uh, this was, for example, uh, mat 3, um, we'd need a way to prevent the core in this mat from changing state if we wanted to store a zero. And that's done quite easily. There's a, on each mat, another wire is passed through all the cores in the mat. So I'll add another wire. So what we have now is the X wire, the two Y wires, and then we have a third wire going through each core, and that's referred to as the inhibit wire. So if we were passing current through this wire and through this X wire, but we didn't want this core to change state, what we can do is pass the current through the inhibit wire in the opposite direction. And again, it goes through every core in this particular mat, but because um, it's only half the required current to cause the core to change state, it doesn't affect the rest of the cores. It just um, effectively prevents this core from changing state. So we'd have half the required current going in this direction on this wire, half the required current going in the X wire in this direction, that would normally be enough to cause the core to change state. But we also have half the required current going the other way in the inhibit wire. So that effectively reduces the field uh, being applied to this core. So the net result is that we only have half the required current or field required for this core to change state. So it's a combination of the currents applied to the X and Y wires and whether or not we apply a current to the inhibit wire as to which cores get changed and what state they end up in. So that, that now gives us the ability to write whatever value we want into the cores. Now of course we still have the problem of how to read back the information. So what we can do is add yet another wire So now we have four wires going through each core. We have the Y wires, the X wire, the inhibit wire, and the new wire is the sense wire. So we saw on the curve tracer that when the core changes state, um, we get this uh, current pulse. Um, effectively, it's the same principle as when you uh, couple two windings together on a transformer, the changing flux within the uh, core induces a voltage into the wire uh, that's passing through that core and that's what the sense wire picks up. Uh, so what we would do is there is one sense wire that passes through all the cores in each mat and if any of the cores in that mat generate a pulse we can pick it up on the sense wire and we determine that to be the output signal from the memory. We can actually simplify this by removing one of the wires. So if we take out the last wire I put in, so we'll remove the sense wire. And the reason we can do that is because the inhibit and the sense wires are never used at the same time. The inhibit wire is only ever used during the write cycle and the sense line is only ever used during the read cycle. So we can actually combine those two functions into a single wire. Um, it's just up to us to keep track of um, what to use it for and when. So we now have everything we need. We have the ability to individually set the 
values uh, of the magnetization state for any particular cores uh, within our array and we also have the ability to read back that information from the core. It's not quite as straightforward as this and in the next video in this series we'll look at creating a driver to drive um, the currents to enable us to set the value in the core and in the video after that we'll look at developing a sense amplifier to pick up uh, the output signals when we uh, cause the cores to change state. Okay, well I hope you found this first video in this series interesting. We will go into much more detail uh, as we develop the electronics and the core memory itself, um, but just bear in mind all this information is available in far more detail in the book that will be available shortly.